So hello, welcome. Thank you for joining us for today's uh, Sight and Sound Bites webinar. I'm Carrie Fogel. I'm the Senior Director of Development for Foundation Relations at the Iron Year Foundation, and I'll be moderating the webinar today. Um, as you know, we host these featured talks every month featuring different topics in vision loss, hearing loss, head and neck cancer, sinus allergy balance disorders, and conditions of the voice and beyond. Um, so I'm excited to announce that today's topic is head and neck microvascular reconstruction. Um, this is a topic we haven't had anyone present on up to this point, so it's a new topic. We're excited. Um, our speaker is Dr. Matthew Spector. Uh, he is the department's new division chief of head and neck surgical oncology and micro microvascular reconstruction. Uh, a quick reminder before we get started, we aren't using the chat function during the webinar today, but we ask that you submit your questions at any point into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And following the presentation, I will moderate the question and answer portion of the program with Dr. Spector. Um, time permitting, we hope to answer all of the questions. If there are any questions that are left unanswered, we will collect those and we'll send them to Dr. Spector or any other member of the department and get those answers sent to you directly following the program. And as always, there will be a video recording of today's discussion available on the Ioneer Foundation website. Um, so now it's my pleasure to introduce our chairman of the Department of Otolaryngology, Dr. Jose Zavallos, who will give uh, a longer introduction of Dr. Spector today and get our presentation started. So I'll hand it over to Dr. Zavallos right now. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending uh, the Sight and Sound Bites today. Uh, it's really uh, my distinct pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Matthew Spector. Uh, Dr. Spector is, as Kerry mentioned, the Division Chief of Head and Neck Surgical Oncology and Microvascular Reconstruction here at the Department of Otolaryngology at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, Dr. Spector has been here with us for a little bit over one month. Prior to uh, joining the University of Pittsburgh, he was at the University of Michigan, where he co-led the Head and Neck Cancer Program in a storied and very large uh, Head and Neck uh, Cancer Program. Uh, he did his residency and his fellowship at the University of Michigan. Uh, interestingly, uh, he has a connection to Pittsburgh uh, prior to him coming and, and meeting all of us here. Both of his parents went to CMU, and I think his brother went to CMU as well, all uh, mathematicians. Um, personally, I am thrilled that Dr. Spector is here. Uh, one of my goals has been to recruit the best and the brightest head and neck surgeons uh, and otolaryngologists to the University of Pittsburgh. And I can say wholeheartedly that we have accomplished just that by bringing Dr. Spector on board. He has over 10 years of experience as a head and neck microsurgeon and really has led the country in terms of uh, high volume efficiency of care and innovation in head and neck reconstruction in particular. Uh, he is a great person. I hope that many of you are able to meet him over the next couple of uh, next several years. Uh, and uh, he has already, in the short time he's been here, really transform the way we do these cases, these very complex cases that he'll, you'll hear about today. Uh, so without further ado, Matt, uh, welcome uh, and uh, looking forward to your talk. So thank you very much. Oh yeah, thanks, thanks for having me, Carrie, Jose. This is wonderful to be here. So I've been here one month now. Uh, I've been in and out of Pittsburgh all my life though with my parents and my brother being here. And so it doesn't, it doesn't feel in like an unfamiliar place. And so it's already, I've been welcomed so graciously, and it's it's great to be here, and I'm excited to meet everybody and 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 continue to build a, an excellent program. Um, so my talk today is an overview of microvascular reconstruction, and uh, I have I have pictures. I want to give that warning right now. So I have some pictures of things. Most of them are very kind of okay looking. If you don't like them, just look away from it, and I can continue to click quickly through them. But I think it helps to understand, you know, where where we came from and where we're going with this type of reconstruction. Um, and so we have really two things we're going to focus on today. One is kind of looking at the role of free flaps or, you know, these, these types of reconstruction where we bring a piece of the body from the arm or the leg or the abdomen or the back up to the head and neck to rebuild a part um, for cancer. And then we'll look at all these different subsites. And I'll show you some examples of how that looks. And this is an example of a tongue cancer. So this is one of the most common types of cancer that we see. So we're looking straight on. This is the lateral tongue. You can see the bottom teeth here. And there's just this small growth here that uh, 
this young woman had for, you know, about three months and then thought it was a bite and then it ended up being a cancer. And so these marks are where we're kind of planning the excision. So I'll show you how that works too. So what is, how do we think about reconstruction, right? And so it's, it's a lot like building anything that you've ever done before, building a house or, a, you know, you know, basically any type of construction. There's different ladders or rungs that you can do and there's very simple and there's very complicated. Simply, we used to start down here. So what secondary intention means is you just kind of leave it. So you remove something, maybe this is a mole that the dermatologist scrapes off and then you just kind of leave it and your body as resilient as it is can grow in and grow the tissue back together. Um, you can just sew it right up, right? So you see a lot of stitches, that's primary kind of primary closure. You can do skin grafts. So we talk about people who get burns where we have to take thin pieces of skin and do skin grafting for burns. The free tissue or what I'm gonna talk about today used to be kind of the top of the ladder. And the reason was, is that it was the most complex. It was very difficult. And um, we, didn't, we didn't know a lot about it in the beginning. Think about like transplants, right? I mean, 100 years ago, lung transplants, heart transplants, liver transplants, like the, those type of technology didn't, we didn't have the existing technology to do that. And now those are kind of every day, every big center, just like Pittsburgh is doing these transplants. And so when this started, you have to go back to about the 1970s. And so this publication was actually done at Michigan. Uh, Dr. Baker was someone who trained me there. And um, he published this kind of, you know, seminal paper about reconstruction. And so he rebuilt, right, a tongue with a flap from the leg. The case took 24 hours, okay? There were three head and neck surgeons involved in this operation. I, this, this wasn't around in the 70s, but think about these old phones that we used to have, you know, not even 20, 30 years ago. What does that look like today? Well, in 2023, a single surgeon can do all of this, right? So no more multiple surgeons. We can do these. A lot of them can be under eight hours. Sometimes it's under even four hours. Um, and uh, I would, that's like your Apple watch now, right? And who would have thought when we had these car phones and these big clunky things that now you could take a phone call, you know, on your watch. So what is a free flap? So think of a free flap as a piece of skin or fat or muscle or bone or something on, on your body, somewhere on your body, and we can disconnect it and we can reconnect it. And it has a new artery and a vein. So it's not just kind of, it doesn't just stick down there. So it has a new artery. So the, the one, the most common one that's used is this forearm flap. So the skin from the wrist, it, you can see here, it comes with this artery and vein. So skin from the wrist, we take the skin and the fat, we get an artery and a vein. And then this is what we would see under the microscope. So this is very, very small, right? So here's your, it's only three millimeters, but we're able to sew this very carefully under the microscope. And then we use this something called a vein coupler to couple the veins together. So this is essentially plumbing. We hook up new plumbing and then this piece of skin and fat is a transplant. Uh, you don't reject this transplant, right? This is something of your own body. So there's no rejection on this. Um, and you know the take is about 98% of the time. There's lots of different pieces that we use and they've all been described at different time periods. So, you know, depending on what you need, we've taken flaps from, you know, the back or the abdomen or the arms or the legs or the back of the thigh. I mean, there's all these different sites and these, these numbers on here are kind of the year that they were actually first described. And then obviously there's been a lot of advances since, uh, since that time. Why do we pick what we pick? So it depends on what happens, right? You can imagine that in, in my and Jose's specialty, there's lots of different things that could be, you know, can have cancer. So it could be a mandibular cancer where the bone is, is the problem or a tongue cancer where there's muscle and soft tissue. It could be resurfacing of the skin of the face or the, or the skin of the scalp. It can be the back of the throat or the voice box. And so depending on what we need, we can move up fat or muscle or bone. We think about the volume, right? And so in certain people, you know, for me, for example, maybe my forearm is nice and thin. And so this would be a good spot if I needed a thin resurfacing. Uh, whereas if I needed something bigger, I might use something from my leg. Um, the other thing is, is the donor site, right? And so, you know, many of you might be, you know, musicians. I'm very careful with musicians because I don't want to affect that part of their, their skill. And so, you know, especially think about a guitarist and the complex finger movements for a guitar. I wouldn't want to, I would want to be very careful with parts of the arm for those. Same thing with runners, right? And so if I see a runner, I'm very careful with their legs. 
And so I don't want to take maybe bone or fat or muscle from their leg because I want them to be able to continue to, to be able to do what they enjoy. So, you know, donor site preference and, and is important. So what do these look like? So this is a gentleman I treated about five years ago. Okay. And so he had a lateral tongue cancer, like you saw on the, on the first kind of picture I showed, and this is a piece of his forearm. And so we took that skin and fat and, and, and those blood vessels. And then this is what the new, the new skin kind of looks like on the tongue. So he's able to maintain the elevation and protrusion of his tongue, right? Tongue sticks out. A lot of times with tongue reconstruction, you can change somebody's speech patterns. Like think about when you bite your tongue. You might talk like this because your tongue is really swollen. So those are things I'm thinking about when I'm rebuilding a tongue is how do I you know, prevent you from your tongue being too big or too little? How can I maintain the protrusion and elevation of your tongue? And so a forearm is a very common reconstruction that we use for this. There's always three steps to these cases. And so the first thing we do, we have to harvest the flap. This is planning on harvesting a fibula bone or a, or a leg flap, right? You have two bones in your leg, the tibia and the fibula. And you can actually take out the majority of the fibula and use the bone to rebuild the jaw or the maxilla um, or even the spine in times. Um, the next thing you do is you have to inset it. So that means you sew it in. So as we sewed it on the last one, right, this is, a, this is the skin that was sewn into here. And then finally, we have to hook up the blood vessels. And so this is that, this is an example of a forearm flap. So this is the skin and fat of the, of the forearm that we took off. And here's the artery in the vein, just like a couple of, you know, little plumbing tubes. And then we're able to hook these up. The thing that I really like about doing these in Pittsburgh is that we can use a two team approach. So this is, you can see, so this is, I'm, I'm one of the faculty here and here's another faculty. We have trainees, we have a scrub tech, we have a fellow, all of us work together. To, to help patients. And so this is a patient, you can see my doc, you know, the doctor here is working on the head and then you know, I'm helping you know, work on the back because we're taking part of the back to rebuild part of the head and the neck. Um, I have a couple more like examples of how this looks after I kind of explained it. So I'll show you some pictures. These are kind of the funny pictures. Um, here's a lateral tongue cancer, right? So this is a growth on the tongue. You can see it's got raised edges. It's a little bit white. Sometimes they can be painful. So we always say, if you have, you know anybody that has spots on their tongue or their throat or their mouth, we're always happy to see them and get them in for a biopsy right away. A biopsy is the only way you can tell what these, what these are. Um, what we do is we have to take part of that tongue out. So wherever you see cancer, cancer can grow with little fingers. And so we remove this with what we call a one centimeter margin. And that's based on national guidelines that were helped develop, some of them at Pittsburgh actually, to, to understand how much of the tongue to take. And this is what it looks like. Again, a gross picture, part of the tongue is gone and you know it's less than half of the tongue, but you can imagine if we just kind of let this close up or we just didn't do anything, it would really limit the mobility of the tongue. So here, here's what it looks like. So we're gonna take this skin and fat and these dots are areas I take extra fat because sometimes you wanna make it fit right. So you wanna take enough fat to make it fit. So you can see how I took this extra fat here with this piece of skin and then the artery in the vein. One more gross picture, when people wake up, they're really swollen, right? So super swollen, everything doesn't look right, everything's distorted. That's because your body's response to inflammation is always swelling. Like think about a Charlie horse or a pulled muscle, everything always swells up. And then here's that same guy I showed you. So here he is, at, you, know, you know, after the surgery, all healed up and really has a normal, normal function. So, you know, one of my one of my charges here by Jose, right, or Dr. Zavios is to to help, you know, build this program and to continue to offer this to to our patient population. But we also have to research it because the questions become, well, how do you know what you're doing is the best or is this the optimum reconstruction or, you know, so my other kind of hat here is to do research on what we call functional outcomes. And so I wrote this paper, this is a few years ago, and obviously we're the next steps of this are going forward now, but this is a paper I wrote a few years ago with one of my partners, Dr. Chapea. He was my mentor at Michigan about looking at, well, how do you know you built the tongue properly? Like what are the metrics we can use to know that patients are, you know, happy, satisfied, able to speak and swallow again? So we did, we gave people some surveys, right? We called, you know, so we asked people, you know, well, how good is your speech? So each one of these dots represents a patient. 
And this is this is a little data heavy, but this I think it'll get to the point really quickly here. So each one of these dot is a person. And I said, well, how understandable is your speech? Can you go up to somebody that you've never met and ask them questions? Could you ask someone for directions on the street and how well do they understand you? And a five is the best score. So you see most of our people here, they kind of clustered at five. There were some fours and some threes where five is the best answer. But what we learned is, is that if you can elevate your tongue better, right, lift it up, that gave you a better score. You can see how the fives are kind of higher up as opposed to the fours and the threes. So we try to target as surgeons, we want to give a patient two centimeters of elevation of their tongue so that they can have a, a better out, a functional outcome. The same thing happens with eating in public. So this is a big thing. So, you know, I ask people questions like, well, if you go out to dinner, will you go do it in public? Or if, you're, if your spouse wants to go somewhere, like do you want to eat at home or are you willing to go to a restaurant and try something new? What kind of things do you eat at a restaurant? Like what, you know, are you limited on the menu? And so eating in public, again, five is the best answer. Each one of these dots represents a patient. And you can see the, there's a lot of fives and some fours in here. And so the fives kind of cluster here. And so what we were able to determine with this is you can see if you can lift your tongue up, right? So protrusion of the tongue, right? Past the teeth, the farther you can get out, the better. People that could protrude their tongue better were able to eat in public or were more comfortable eating in public. And so, you know, when I'm setting targets for my patients and figuring out, well, how do I rebuild this? These are really good targets that we've published. And, and nationally, this is known that other surgeons are looking toward, you know, towards this type of research to determine their metrics. We have lots of different things. And so I'll kind of finish up the next few minutes showing what other types of things we have to rebuild. Sometimes it's not half a tongue. Sometimes it's a whole tongue. So this is a gentleman. He's about four years out from surgery. And this is a piece of his abdomen. So we can take a piece of the, uh, of the belly and rebuild the tongue with this. And you can see he can still stick that tongue out. So on the left, you see this kind of tongue is back. The tongue goes out and it even has hair, which seems kind of weird, but other parts of our body also have hair. So sometimes these tongues get a little hairy. We do laser surgery on the hair sometimes, and there's things we do for, but most people aren't really bothered by it. The other cool thing we can do is I can use new technology like 3D modeling, 3D printing, and some, you know, basically biomedical engineering, and I can help rebuild you know, jaw, the jaw and the maxilla or the upper cheeks with this. So this is a young woman who had a cancer. You can see we're looking down from the head. We can see a cancer on the inside of the jaw here. And so that's what this red, red little dot is here. So it involves some teeth and some bone and a little bit of the tongue. So what we did is we have, and we have all this, all this technology here in Pittsburgh. And so Pittsburgh can print these models for me. Um, and so this is the model off of the CT scan of this patient where I can see I marked with black here. You can see where the tumor is. And then I have to put a plate on, right? So we're going to take out this piece of bone. So you can see this piece of bone is what's going to have to come out. We're going to put a titanium plate on, and then we have to rebuild this. And so for her, I used part of the shoulder blade. And so this is a picture. I actually had a model made of her shoulder blade. So we're looking straight down at her, kind of this plastic model of the shoulder. Uh, the, sh the, the shoulder fits in here, right? So the humerus will fit in there. And then the, sh the, the scapula or the shoulder blade just sits on the back. And then I can take this piece of bone that you can see here off of the shoulder blade. There's really minimal trouble with this. It's obviously stiff in the beginning, but people can get full range of motion of their shoulder um, I'm a little careful with people who have had shoulder surgery. So if you've had a, a shoulder replacement or you've had your rotator cuff done, we're, we were careful about that. Um, but again, you could take this piece of bone off the shoulder blade and here's how it'll fit. So you can see we have the, the plate is here. We took out that piece of bone and you can see that this piece of shoulder blade, I've kind of slid it in there of how, of how it's going to fit all together again. Uh, okay, time for one more gross picture. So this is that piece that we had to take out, right? It's really unfortunate, but the cancer involved the bone and the teeth. It's hard to see, but the shoulder blade is actually surrounded by muscle here. And then this is a piece of skin I took with it. And you can see we actually hooked the two arteries and veins together. So the plumbing comes together like the plumbing in your basement. And then all these pipes, I can hook up just one set of pipes instead of having to hook up two sets of pipes here. Um, this is what it looks like from the next side, right? Gross picture, but here's the bone. Here's that artery and vein coming down. 
And right after surgery, again, it's pretty ugly, right? It's all swollen. The tongue is way over here. But if you wait about six months, this is what you get. And so you can see that new piece of skin really fits well on here. She's got a new jawbone here, right? That, that's fitting in here. And then look at her elevation and protrusion of the tongue, which I told you is a really strong metric for, for a functional outcome. And so if you ask her, I mean, she would eat in public with her, with her husband. She would go to, to any type of restaurant or go up to anybody in any type of situation and ask for directions or be able to talk to them. So we consider this a good outcome. I've got one more example from you, right? Patients that have head and neck cancer come in all shapes and sizes. And this is a young woman I treated about three years ago. So she had a tumor of her parotid gland. And so the parotid gland is one of your saliva glands. And so um, you, can, you can imagine if you get a tumor here, it can be very sensitive. The nerve to the face, right? The one that controls our smile and our eyebrows and our sprinkling of our nose, that nerve is, comes out of the parotid gland. And so you probably met someone in your lifetime that's had Bell's palsy or a stroke where that one side is droopy. That's the risk we take with going under, you know, doing the surgery in the parotid gland. So we have to be very careful in this area. Um, I obviously, I, you know, this is in a clinic and you can see that I drew on her cheek in clinic and I did this on purpose because I wanted her to really understand what it would be like to have these incisions and what things would look like. And, you know, I'm very careful with counseling people because I want them to, you know, it's always hard to explain what it's going to be like afterward, right? These surgeries can be life-changing, right? Different speaking, different swallowing, right? It can, it can be very different. There can be disfigurement, but if you, you know, if you're just honest with people and tell them what you're thinking, I think that that's kind of a good way to go it. So me and her mom, we did this in clinic where I showed her all these little dots represent one of the tumors in there. You can see her old incision here. This is her asleep. So we did these, we hear all these little dots or little tumors that we could feel. Here, we're gonna take part of the back. So we're taking a piece of the kind of the, the back here. We chose this to minimize the scarring. This would hide well on her back um, and, and that's what she wanted. Here's one of these gross pictures again, but here's all these little nerves. See these little white things represent the facial nerve. So. If you cut this branch right here, you wouldn't be able to like lower your lip and smile. Or if you cut this branch, you can't blink your eye anymore. So these surgeries can be, you know, very, very difficult just to make sure we're saving all of these nerves to making sure that she has a good outcome. Here she is right after surgery. So that's a new piece of skin that we put on there. This is the first day after surgery. And you can see everything is looking good. The color match is really good. And then here she is last year. And so you can see her smile is perfect and you can barely see there's really no contour changes here. Uh, I have one more example. This is a younger guy. So I did him, this is about four years ago. He's four years out from surgery, but we did the same thing, took the skin off in this area and, um, and we had to resurface this with this part of his back. And he, I use this picture to show he's a little bit longer out. And so you can see it, the, the, the contour is right. The color match is pretty good. You can still see these incisions, but there's not a lot you can do. I mean, he's, you can see he's got no extra fat on him. So there's no real hiding a lot of these incisions. And then contour wise, he looks really good here. His ear is a little farther out on this side. Um, but again, that's something I talk to him about. And I say, hey, look, when you're older, if this ever bothers you or, or kids ever tease you or anything, you got to let me know because there's things we can do to, to do to fix it. That's all I have. This is my family. We're from Southern Illinois originally. So if you go back, my parents after Carnegie Mellon, they moved to Southern Illinois to be math professors. And um, so you, I, I grew up around rodeos. And so uh, these are my these are my kids. This is Brad, Nick, Nora, and John. And um, this was at a at a benefit rodeo in um, this past summer. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Spector. Um, and thank you for sharing the picture of your family and a little bit about your background and your connection to Pittsburgh. I didn't even know that. So uh, we're thrilled that you're here and you are already surgically, clinically, highly busy. Uh, for those listening, Dr. Spector was in the OR until about five minutes before uh, we started this webinar today. So he, he made some time in his busy schedule. Um, we do have several questions that we can go ahead and get started answering uh, with our speaker. Um, please uh, feel free to ask more. We have probably enough time to get through all of them today. And again, if you think of something at a later time and you'd like uh, you know, an answer sent back to you, you can always contact me or uh, my colleague, Craig Smith, um, 
through the website, and we'd be happy to ask any questions of Dr. Spector or Dr. Zavios or any member of the head and neck cancer team. Um, so I'll get started over here, and I'll ask our first question, which is, uh, assuming there are many, what are some of the uh, largest potential side effects of these types of complicated surgeries? Yeah, there, there is a lot. And so side effects, we'll, we'll group them into two. And so we'll look at the donor site first. So if we're taking it from the arm, you know, you can, you have to wear a cast or a skin graft or a, a, like a splint on the arm for a while. And so we require you to do some rehab. So we get you a little ball that you'll be able to squeeze to make sure your finger muscles stay strong. There's no nerves or muscles damage, but just the tightness can be. So the donor site can have tightness or stiffness. Um, there can always be pain there, but it's actually, most of these are not that painful. Um, you, if we take muscle, right, there has to be rehabilitation. So sometimes we take a slip of the leg muscle to rebuild part of the tongue or maybe even a part of the, the facial muscles. Then you have some stiffness of the leg, right? So you have four muscles in the leg, the quadriceps. We might take a little slip of one, but then those other three plus that what you left have to get some rehab. And so there can be, you know, some stiffness and soreness of those muscles. The other, the other group of side effects are obviously, you know, what we, what we're rebuilding. And so there can be, depending on what we're doing, there can be some, some different things, right? If I'm rebuilding a tongue, it's usually three or four weeks before you can really fully swallow again. So while you're healing, um, you need a feeding tube. And so that usually slips in through the nose. If that's uncomfortable, we can put it in the belly to hide under the clothes, but those tubes help to get your nutrition, right? I mean, we need to optimize someone's, you know, a healing ability. And part of that is, you know, getting your nutrition. So the tube can be uncomfortable a little bit. The, um, the swelling can be a little uncomfortable. You can drool a little bit right after the surgery. Again, it's, you have to look at the big picture. And sometimes I try to use these pictures with patients. I say, Hey, look, let, let me show you someone that I've done that, how this works and, and what we can, we can do for this. So. Following that, you know, if you are rebuilding um, a tongue, does the, if you are able to save any part of it, does that retain any of your taste function or does that kind of go away once you cut into it or dissect it? So the taste is super complex. So you can't taste anymore on that part of the tongue after the surgery. So, but remember your taste buds are all over your mouth. And interestingly, most of taste is actually smell. So I know there's, there's a lot of components of taste, right? But if you can smell something, a lot of times that's about 75% of the battle. So if you take half of a tongue, the other half can run the taste buds and the back of the tongue also has taste buds and there's kind of minor taste buds around the mouth. So um, if you do, a, if the whole tongue comes out, it's harder, but as long as people can still smell and the back of the tongue is there, people usually say they can, they have, they're able to taste still. Thank you, interesting. Um, Next question, are the nerves also connected to the nerves function? Does the patient have sensory or motor function post-surgery? Another, another great question. So I am very, very interested in this, okay? So we, we do hook up nerves and I've published a paper showing if I hook up new nerves to the tongue, people actually even get a better result than what I've already showed you. So that's the next iteration of my research is, how do I hook up nerves? What nerves to hook up? Which ones are important? Um, and so, yeah, we, we've, we've kind of at the beginning of a study going on right now at Pittsburgh, where we're looking at hooking up nerves and showing that you can get better outcomes. Most of those are sensory nerves. And so we, we hook up sensory nerves to, to make the, you know, the, the tongue feeling better. There, there's something to be said about how you feel your tongue in your mouth and how it helps you make T sounds and R sounds and just kind of the, the movement there. It doesn't help with taste because there's no taste buds, but it does help with kind of how you perceive your speech and how you can improve your speech, so. Okay, great, thank you. That's interesting to know that's an area that you hope to pursue in the future. Um, is there a situation or a type of disease where you know, this type of surgery might not be successful. And, and if it's not successful, would you ever reattempt a surgery like this? Yeah, it's another, these are all great questions. So I told you the success rate is about 98%. And someone must have, someone out there, the, the pessimist might've said, well, what about the 2%? You know, I, I'm a very positive 
person. And when I talk to people, I try to focus on the positives, but we, we clearly do have that conversation like that you just asked, right? Well, what happens if it doesn't work or what are my options? The nice thing is, is there's usually two pieces of everything, right? So if we, the, the left arm doesn't work, you have the right arm that we can use or the, or the left leg or the right leg. Um, but we have to redo flaps about 2% of the time. We, we never know why it's going to happen. It's not related to age. It's not related to gender. It's not related to the type of cancer. Um, people have heard of some blood disorders, right? So there's some clotting disorders out there. There, Factor V Leiden is one of them, if you've ever heard of that. Um, but people who have lots of clots already or who have a history of clotting, we think that might cause some clots in these things. And we're, we do things ahead of time to thin the blood and, and try to help and help them through that. Um, we have a very careful protocol in the hospital to monitor these. So this is not just a, you hook it up and then you're done. We check these every hour or two in the hospital while you're here for you know, 24, 48 hours. The first 48 hours is the most important. If it goes down or the artery clots or the vein clots in that first time, we're able to fix it if we catch it within four hours. So my team is there at the bedside every hour checking this, you know, this reconstruction to, to make sure we can salvage it if we need to. But yeah, when it, when it doesn't work, it's very, it's a hard conversation, but we're, we're able to go back in and usually fix it. Well, that's great. 98% success rate is, is pretty, pretty good. Um, are any of these surgeries done or assisted by robotic surgical equipment? Yes, and so I'm I'm robotics trained. Um, Dr. Zavios is robotics trained. We have another other, a, a number of other robotic surgeons in our group. Um, usually, those are used for removing the cancer. So think about the robot is really helpful to get into places that we can't see easily. So the back of the throat, the you know deep down in the throat here, the back of the tongue, anything we have to go around a corner, the robot's super helpful. So a lot of times we can remove parts of the tumors in, you know, and, and do that robotically. Um, but a lot of times the reconstructive part, we don't do robotically. The, the suturing robotically is very, it's very finicky. And so a lot of times we do that, you know, usually just looking in the mouth or looking through the neck. You can actually, you know, it sounds crazy, but you can see the throat through the neck if you look in the right place. And so a lot of times people are getting lymph node samples. So we can do some sewing through here and some sewing through here. Right, interesting. I know a lot of people are interested uh, in the progression of robotic surgery, so that's always good as it tends to be less invasive. Um, so when you're thinking about these surgical procedures, how do you consider uh, people who also need chemo and radiation and the timing of how you, you, you think about how you're going to go about doing all these things for a person being diagnosed with cancer that could be I'm wondering, overwhelming. Um, so how do you kind of work together to figure out what, what comes first? Yeah, I mean, head and neck cancer is treated with a, a multidisciplinary team and it always involves a radiation oncologist and a medical oncologist. Um, you, you may never meet those people right away, right? So a lot of times it's behind the scenes. So last night, our whole group got together for over an hour and we talked about patients and that's what a tumor board is, right? And so I presented my patients and, you know, each surgeon brings their patients to the board and we all talk about them to make sure we're providing, you know, high quality national guideline driven care. Um, and so, and so all three help to make those decisions and radiation and chemo are important for most patients with head and neck cancer. Um, they usually get it after treatment. And so radiation is much more common. About 90% of patients with head and neck cancer will get radiation after surgery. And about 40% will get chemotherapy as well with the radiation after the surgery. But those are very specific subsites of the cancer and very guideline driven. So for example, if you had a throat cancer, that's treated a little differently than a tongue cancer. That's treated a little differently than, you know, jaw cancer. And so again, we, each patient, we, we talk about it before the surgery. Even. So surgery is part of your treatment and here's the radiation doctor who can help with the next part. And here's the medical oncologist who can help with the chemo part. Great. Thank you. Um, moving on. If, if a patient requires uh, dental reconstruction or ongoing dental care, is that something that could be covered by medical insurance? Yeah, this is a great, another, again, everyone's spot on with these questions. Um, you're, you're on the edge of kind of the, what, we, what we discuss with people every day. 
Right now, dental insurance does not really cover this. Um, but here's the big but. So coming to Pittsburgh, the dental integration with our head and neck cancer care is ahead of the curve in, in around the country. And so the dental team will come in and do extractions while we're doing some of these surgeries. The follow-up care and survivorship, there's a dentist that's involved to see patients afterward. And frankly, the foundation has already supported a number of dentists to help fund that work already. And so coming here and just hearing that was, you know, that's a question that I have to try to explain to people and, and, you're, and you're already all over it. So that's great. Great, thank you. Um, I know we kind of touched on this before with the success rate, but is there any situation you can imagine where you would not attempt surgery or have you had patients in the past where you just knew that this type of surgery was not gonna be successful for some reason? Yes, I, uh, I, I'm giving a talk the next, or we have a, a national meeting and the talk is called the unreconstructable patient. So it's like the challenges of that, that exact same question. So think about the plumber analogy, right? As a plumber, I need to hook up a new artery and a vein. And you could very easily see, well, what if there's no arteries or veins to hook up to? And so that can be a very challenging thing, right? So usually we're using arteries and veins in this part of the neck. There's more in this part of the neck. You can actually take them out of the chest to get those parts of the neck. But what if there is an exhaustion of vessels or you know, arteries and veins, or what if there's an exhaustion of pieces, right? I mean, we've had patients undergo five or six reconstructive surgeries to rebuild all this. And so there are absolutely situations. They're very, very rare. Um, they're less than probably less than one a year, even if you're doing two or 300 of these, I mean, it's a very rare situation, but yeah. And again, those require very difficult discussions and just complete honesty and saying, I, I don't know how to, don't know how we can do this. Here are the options. And, and the risk goes up with those too. I mean, you can hook up connections or what we call vein graphs, right? So you could hook up an artery in the leg and run it all the way up to the head, but that is a high risk procedure, right? Cause you have a vein that's this long that has to have flow the whole time and there could get clots or kinks. And so there are kind of extreme measures that we can do, but um, it, it's certainly an area that we need to, to be better at. Great, thank you. Um, I'll ask one more question and then uh, I'll leave it to you and Dr. Zavios if there's anything you wanna leave on. Um, but the last question would be, if a surgery is successful and you're using tissue from another part of the body in you know, the head and neck, the mouth, um, it, does it ever have a tendency to die or does it cause complications if the transplant doesn't work? Yeah, so there's, there's actually two ways that can happen. So it's most common if someone is undergoing a second operation. So let's say we do, you know, great surgery and they get radiation and everything looks great. And then maybe a few years later, unfortunately, a cancer comes back and we're in a situation where we have to go back in and do something. If a patient's already had radiation, I can reconstruct whatever we're removing, but sometimes radiated tissue doesn't heal the way that other tissue does. So if you if you had a cut on your left arm and your right arm and one was radiated and one wasn't, one will take six weeks longer to heal. And so that, that happens in the jaw too. So we'll perform a, a great reconstruction and everyone will be happy, but the radiated area or the native tissue just doesn't heal as quickly. And so that, that's one example of where you can have a wound healing problem or a complication later after that. The other one that's rare is we do see late free flap loss, but it's, it could be 10 years out. And we don't know why that happens either. But again, I'll have, you know, I might have a thousand or 1500 people that I take care of in my practice and one or two, right? So like 0.1% will have this, you know, delayed problem where 10 years out, something happens. We don't know if it's a blood vessel problem. They're always radiated. So radiation is probably what it's causing it. If you're not radiated, you know, that doesn't happen, but it can, you know, have a loss. And at that time, you know, we look about doing a second flap. Um, if things are going to lose it, usually you, you lose it in 48 hours, like I said. So if something's going to happen that of that 2% that we lose, right, 1.99% of that happens in the first 48 hours. And then after that, we can have losses, but they're very rare after that. Thank you. Um, that kind of covers it in, as far as the questions from the audience. Um, if there's anything that you, I see Dr. Zavios is uh, still here with us. If there's anything you'd like to say about this field, anything that you um, are prioritizing 
now that you're here um, in the department at, in, at Pitt, uh, please feel free to share that with our audience. And after that, I will go ahead and say farewell to, to our guests and to our speakers. Uh, happy to get started on that. Uh, first of all, thank you, Matt, for a, a great talk that really covers um, and, and showcases a complexity that our patients face and the kinds of um, techniques that we have to overcome them. And I think uh, it's interesting that the Ionier Foundation, this is the first time we've covered this topic because it really is central to cutting edge head and neck cancer care. And I think having uh, Dr. Spector here uh, and the rest of our team, Dr. Contrera, Dr. Iver, as well as the existing folks at the Shrideron doing these reconstructions, uh, we, we will elevate the level of reconstruction, the innovation and research, as, as Matt mentioned. Uh, and, and we are obviously very, very thankful for the support of the foundation in doing so, because this is what's going to drive um, the, the next generation of treatments for these complex, complex cancers. So thank you, Matt, for, for really showcasing that. And maybe you can speak a little bit about what we hope to do in terms of functional outcomes and how uh, we will be measuring uh, our outcomes for our patients in, in a very objective way in order to help move the needle on, on, on these reconstructions even further. Yeah, you know, thanks, Jose. I mean, we there's a lot we have on the docket, right? I told you a little bit about our nerve grafting and tongue reconstruction, but we we have to set metrics that matter, right? So, you know, what can you eat? What do you want to eat? Are you able to go out and talk to people in public? You know, can we do a swallowing test to watch how well you swallow? And so, you know, our group, Dr. Zavios and I and our and our whole team can design, you know, trials or metrics or goals for patients. And then we can study them and we can be the leaders around, you know, nationally for this to show people, you know, what, what we're able to achieve with the, the types of research that we're doing. That's great. Thank you so much to both, um, both of you for our uh, webinar today. I think I'll go ahead and uh, let everyone go finish out their lunch hour. Um, again, if you have any questions, feel free to contact anyone at the foundation to get in touch with Dr. Spector. Um, to ask him anything you didn't get a chance to ask. Uh, thanks to our speakers. Thanks to our audience. Uh, everyone take care and have a nice afternoon.